Welcome. Today we're talking with Asli Yeshin. Welcome, Asli Jan. Çok teşekkürler. Um, thank you. Great to be with you. So, tell me, our goal is to get to know you a little bit. So, I always like to start with people's childhood, where you're from, how you grew up, and then slowly you can move into, I know you traveled a few places before you ended up in the U.S. as well, how you came here, and then what your life here looks like. Whatever you want to share with us. Absolutely. So um, I was born in Mersin, Turkey, in 1965. Soon I'm going to be 55 years old. And then I'm married to my um, high school sweetheart. Mm -hmm. And we have traveled, just like you said, uh, right after getting married in 1988. Uh, we moved to England, lived there two years, took um, classes. Well, in I'm going to slow you down. It's not that usual for uh, a Turkish woman to end up in England. Uh, so how was it? Tell me a little bit more about your family growing up and how it was even that you came to leave the country. I see. Yes. Um, then, uh, right after graduation from college, uh, just like um, thousands of us who couldn't find jobs, we needed to take some English classes. And at that time, it was very easy to get a um, visa to go to um, London, England, very much. And lots of um, English classes were um, offered and easily. So we said, okay, we were not able to find jobs. I was not. And um, so well, that's what did you study in college? What was your college degree? In college, I studied business administration at Gazi University in Ankara. Yeah. And then um, job was an issue. So we said, okay, we need to learn English. And it, it was easy to get an acceptance um, to an English school, Francis King School of English in London. And um, both of us went there right after getting married. And um, it, it, at the time, uh, Margaret Thatcher was there. <laughs> That's how old I am. <laughs> and it was um, really great time. I, I have nothing Hold on, hold on. I'm going to stop you again, because uh, I, I do think this is interesting and rather unusual. H how were your families uh, about you leaving home. It's, it's not that typical that a newly married couple just takes off and goes to England to learn a new language. So tell us a little bit more. Uh, about yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, it is an unusual uh, Turkish family, I would call it for its time. Uh, at that time, you're talking 1988. Um, we were, I was very much, I, I grew up being encouraged to have my own career and um, have big dreams and uh, family was extremely supportive. My dad, first graduate of um, you know, Istanbul University, a university graduate in the, in the family, was um, very big on us learning English and becoming independent, all that. And both my parents and um, at the time at the time of graduation we were it was always talked about how we need to and I, I come from a private high school where I learned English all that but um, and I love the language growing up though my dad worked for a mobile oil company where with the Americans in um, Mersin Atash, uh, Atash refinery is a uh, obviously refinery unit of mobile and BP. So growing up, I've always had the um, influence of Americans around me, not American people that I lived with um, per se, but their influences were in the, we call them living job. We were in a campus-like environment where many families interacted with um, uh, American families actually um, they were the ones in 1961 came to uh, to Marsin and built that place so that influenced me growing up influenced me quite a bit um, and my brother and um, later on uh, going through high school and, and college 
always um, learning English was in the back of our minds, um, getting a job. Ironically, you know, 32 years later, it still is an issue. So uh, I was very much supported to do this. And it was a matter of when do I get the opportunity? My husband, Murat Yeshin, was extremely encouraging to um, say, let's do it. We can do it together. Could I have done it together? No, <laughs> on my own. Could, they ha could I have done it on my own? No. So we um iki kapadar it was a lot easier and um two buddies went to um england and literally from the Heathrow airport actually get yeah, then get the airport which is in um town you would just come out uh, we did come out and said which way are we going to go uh we took the cab cab said this way this is the center of the city started making phone calls that's what i'm saying we had no connections no nothing A afterwards though afterwards within 24 hours very good friend of ours my um childhood friend helped me quite a bit Vedat kokulu i'll never forget helped us get jobs get into schools all of that learned taught us what what to do how to do it um and to our, um, sh to my uh, huge shock, I thought I was in speaking English very well, and I could not understand a word they were saying. First one week, um, the thick uh, British accent got in the way quite a bit, and I, I was panicked. I'm constantly reading, so taking a waitress job immediately right off the bat, and then it was easy. Uh, helped me a lot talking to um, uh, English people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's how you were in England, sort of two adventurous young ones going to improve their English. And you yeah. went to school and you worked. And any, no children yet at that point, right? No, we were 23 then. Uh, we had our first son when I was 29, and we were um, 28 actually. He was born in April. But um, yeah, we did not. So um, seven years. Five ago, more years of being a young, married, adventurous couple. What else did you two do? <laughs> in England? In England, England or elsewhere? I don't know. Quite a bit of um, traveling, um, taking the, um, uh, as you know, England is big on public transportation. We did not own a car, but we would go anywhere and experience anything. It, uh, we were open to it. And um, my first reaction, I, my, my mom still keeps those uh, letters. I wrote how free people were expressing the way they felt. And uh, the thing that I wrote was a very important thing to talk about in a letter that would arrive two weeks later to my mom, mm -hmm. is that people are putting their feet on the um, train seats. <laughs> that, is my <laughs> that is my first, um, how shocked I was um, because of um, social pressure. And in Turkey, we don't realize how um, um, inhibited uh, we are in every way possible. So I was seeing young or old people uh, referring to each other with, without any um, sir, madam, and I was using a lot of sir, madams and all that. And they were laughing at me because that's what I saw in the movies or I read in the books and s some uh, ridiculous moments. So, but I remember feeling very free, um, com country accepting us and felt like, oh, wow, we're from a Muslim country and these guys are, are, are just uh, very open and um, accepting us. Later on, within six months, Murat found a job in a laboratory um, that um, was uh, London School Hammersmith Hospital's lab. So he's a biology graduate. Um, so that really changed quite a bit uh, who we were interacting with, what we were doing. And his professor, Dr. Bloom hired me as a non-typing secretary. <laughs> so so that was a typing secretary. Because <laughs> I, I, we did not have, um, uh, you know, typing lessons, anything like that in Turkey. Um, mm -hmm. Many people did, but I thought I wouldn't be um, caught doing that. But I did. So um, I went through the training and everything. I still can't type, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> 32 years later. And 
overall Eng England gave us the um, you know ticket to come to America, which was always and always I've always talked about wanting and wishing and um, doing everything necessary to get here. And um, we were talking about earlier how hard it was to, to some of us who seem to be very comfortable in this country, um, you know, 32 years later, it was a um, big ordeal, a um, lot of uncertainty if the visa was going to be accepted, um, uh, renewed, we came with J visa, work visa, all of that was a huge dealing with attorneys, dealing with uh, many people giving us right or wrong advice. Um, so uh, a lot happened on the way to heaven, I should say. Uh, it, we are um, blessed to have an, an, you know, very comfortable lives over here, but it was not uh, from a lottery. It was hard, hard work and not giving up, a lot of persistence. And um, to those I appreciate who you saying that because we don't have uh, here a lot of legal immigration stories and people assume that that's maybe simple and easy. However, it does take a lot of years and persistence and perseveration. Uh, often people have to repeat their uh, degrees. So it's yeah, yeah. Nice to hear of that. Yes, when I um, uh, got my MBA degree, it was almost a necessity, not a repeat for me, obviously. I only had an undergrad, but I wasn't really planning on get, getting a master's degree if I had stayed in Turkey. My plan was to have an American university um, diploma, and it, you know, it could only come in the form of the next degree, which would have been a um, uh, master's degree. So getting... Uh, uh, passing the TOEFLs and GMAT exams, taking it again, feeling very frustrated, um, inadequate. And um, it had been three years already we were here and I wasn't uh, really making any strides in that. And I kind of, I remember feeling like I am a college graduate. I shouldn't be working at a, um, you know, laboratory pro professor's assistant and all of that. Mm -hmm. So, or work at a bookstore, um, uh, you know, waitressing, bookstores and working as an assistant, very, you know, different things. I knew it was a stepping stone for me to get to where I want it. And always a financial degree in the finance field. Numbers meant so much to me since I was very little easy to do for me. But getting there, how to maneuver and not stray from your actual goals and not feel frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, many people know me as a very happy-go-lucky person, uh, but there were days I doubted that this was going to happen. And you, you question yourself that, um, should I have not come to this country? Mm -hmm. uh, did I just um, give up? what could have been over there so there is doubt in early 30s that you're there's there was still doubt about should we be staying here um but overall though uh you know do you remember what uh, during that period of doubt and not knowing you know there are those times where we don't yet see the end of the the light at the end of the tunnel or we don't get to peek into the future do you know when you yet didn't know and were in the dark what supported you my husband supported me a lot um getting the degree having the baby at the age of 28 um it, 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 he was in my backpack when I was studying, going to school, li libraries, and um, it, because it was not a typical um, Turkish family where the expectation is that I cook and clean and, and be good, um, our, both our degrees, our careers were as important, and we really went into this as, a, as a partners who's, who's going to make it, who'd support all the way. Mm -hmm. um, as quiet as, as my husband is, he's very vocal about, yeah, you know, going, what is your next step? What should you be doing? And, and he'll be talking about his uh, next steps too. It is not about, okay, we made it here. Uh, I mean, I never felt like I made it here. I always felt like comfortable, yes, fun, but we should be challenging ourselves or else it's depressing to say that I'm done.
So maybe that's a commonality among Turkish American women that we have feminist husbands who support us and who want us also to uh, have a professional existence outside of the house and who are very open-minded, maybe more open-minded than a typical Turkish man yes. would be. Yep, we happen to be those wives who made it here and absolutely, otherwise it would have been a lot, lot harder, yep. Yeah, so then with a kid, uh, you're managing to go through school. Where were you? Did you come here right away to Michigan? Tell me a little bit about the places you lived in America. So got married in 88. In 1990, June of 1990, we came to um, University of Michigan where he, my husband worked at. And um, that was, at that time, we lived in Ann Arbor, did not even own a car. But within a year at University of Michigan, my husband's um, professor became the chairman of internal medicine at University of Virginia. So that was a huge opportunity for us because he was building his own lab. Uh, by the way, it's an endocrinology lab. So we would be, um, go, we were offered to go within a year. Within nine months, it was clear that we were doing. So June to June, actually, we moved, 1991. We were um, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Mm -hmm. amazing campus just like University of Michigan uh, it's um, it's a good, good school and but the weather was very much in line with Marcin's weather mm -hmm. <laughs> because by the time we came here it was cold uh, I had obviously I studied in Ankara but never seen it snow like that um, and in 1990 it was particularly um, tough I mm -hmm. should say February of 1991 was the toughest that I remember because we did not own a car, we were wearing our boots and walking to where I worked at the bookstore. And my husband was, um, you know, going uh, to work by um, just walking or taking the bus at wherever it was possible. But we were pretty close. Mm -hmm. Then in Virginia, got my MBA, baby was born. He was two and a half. Our uh, older son was born uh, in 1994. He was two and a half years old when I graduated. And um, then I started, because of family here in Ann Arbor, we um, said, okay, let's go to uh, Michigan back and so that our son grows up uh, with family. And mind you, University of Virginia, University of Michigan, as good of uh, you know, schools that he could just continue, my husband would continue to work. So that was an opportunity. I started interviewing here, got my job at Comerica as a um, lender, commercial lender. Um, that continued 15 years um, in different uh, banks, uh, but loved my career. It was really good, but I always wanted to be a stockbroker. In the back of my mind, I, I was watching stock market while doing commercial loans. So, so loved stock market. And uh, I was 47 years old when I passed the exam. Wow. Uh, National, national exam and in Turkey a couple of comments came uh, uh, life was just starting for me uh, at the age of 47 in what I wanted to do I love that I love that I know so often young ones especially I remember as a child thinking uh, I remember when my mom turned 40 and I thought oh poor woman, her life is over. And then when I turned 40, I still remembered that and thought, no, 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 no way. I'm going to prove myself wrong about that one. Just starting out, you are a lot more um, decisive and you know what you don't want. Yeah. Uh, so absolutely, if all of us. Um, after 40, things got a lot clearer for me and a lot happier, less doubts. Um, yeah. Yeah, I love you speaking to that because we don't often hear again about this in the general media or social media, the upsides of aging. You know, there are yeah. many of those and knowing ourselves and being more comfortable in our skin is one of those things. And I would never trade that for my 20s. Absolutely. 20s, dangerous years, tough years. Um, as you said, there's no roadmap. Where are you going? Uh, whatever's next and good, good choices. Are we going to make them? Or what are we giving up in a different country? As you know, we are not coming from a war-torn 
country, unfortunately, those people had to come here anyways. They had to run away. That's not what we did. And that's why we had more doubts that could have, should have, maybe. Yeah. But um, the more um, support around you, family is extremely important. In, um, in Ann Arbor, our family here is very extremely supportive. Um, Rat's um, uncle and our aunt. Um, so it was very important that we were grounded here. Um, very successful people giving us a good um, uh, role model. And our families, and sometimes people ask, are your parents saying, are you going to come back yet? Come back yet? Not really. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it was very important that uh, we were, um, it was really important that we would continue the journey here um, to succeed, to get to the next level and be happy. We were never told, oh, you should come back here. It's really um, rosy here. It was not. There was, there was never a talk like that. Or did I miss them that I would say, oh, how is, you know, without my parents, life is, uh, I will never know. Could I have, uh, if my life could have been a lot easier, but I don't think I had a hard life at all. Um, uh, I am persistent, um, very short term memory for, for bad results mm -hmm. and do bounce back. Um, but at, you know, as a personality, it's just that um, I'm hopeful always, and so no, my parents, no doubt about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So then you're back in Michigan, and uh, you're starting to work, uh, do your dream job. Yes, actually, in Michigan, commercial lending, fifteen years. Then, uh, so I was about um, like 31 years old by the time I graduated and came here and started my dream job. Dream job was to be a commercial lender and vice president. And I became that, uh, many good tr uh, trips and um, international lending, national lending and middle market and small, uh, bus small businesses. These were big timers, big things to achieve. Um, was I not happy? I was happy, but the economy wasn't letting me um, do commercial loans. Uh, 2008 crash was a, a wake up call for so many of us on the lending on credit side. Mm -hmm. um, basically, Michigan is tier threes and tier twos to the three big um, automotive um, you know, companies you would be lending to their suppliers. And we were not able to because of the economy. So around that, at the end of 2012, I, at mid 2012, I knew I was going to change careers. Then you start studying. Mm. And series seven for, um, you know, Securities Exchange Commission um, uh, licensing um, is a big deal in that world. And so left my vice presidency, moved to a company, a, a partnership, uh, the company that I work for. Uh, where I'm owning, I, the, the proposition was that I would own a franchise of a branch um, that was hard to do, tough to go through, but I wanted that. And um, there were lots of things that w could stop me from uh, continuing, but I knew not to go back to commercial lending. So I uh, said, I'm going to pass this exam and, um, and Beginning of 2013, I started and opened up my branch, um, so in Ann Arbor. So one could uh, say, in order to be successful in life, you really have to be flexible and willing to start over and work towards a new goal as the times and the world changes. I imagine there being a lot there to take for whoever might be listening who currently is facing a difficult situation due to the pandemic so many people are losing their jobs and I imagine many might have to do some of what you did which is look at the current situation and the reality and change course start over that's exactly that's exactly what it, it, people should do especially younger generation and not necessarily only younger generation I was 47 as I was saying you're switching a career 
you are by nature, by design, you are going into a very rough ride. Mm-hmm. And just write this down every time you run into something. So I am just saying like for uh, younger people, you don't know where this is that should be going. Uh, but for older people, you know what you don't want and what you want more. Mm-hmm. So we're harder. But just like you said, it's the exact um, thing that I've always um, repeated to newcomers to my industry. Be flexible nimble enough to uh, respond back in a, in a way that is positive, to bring back positive responses. It, you could be very upset. You could say, I am done with this, but what is your next opportunity? Always plan A and plan B. In between, just ask yourself, what is this worth to me? How much do I want this? And at, when you're answering those questions, you are going to answer why you got back up again and we'll try again this morning. So what is it worth to me? So I've always said that I know I want this. It is uh, going to be hard. And also leaving a salary job to move to a commission only job in the world of anybody um, considering that's a, that's a toughie. I've been blessed to not really worry about that uh, for a long time. But, but um, making this a business work. Um, and what I do is I help people reach their financial goals. We're in the stock uh, market and people think that I am, this is Las Vegas. We are guessing and betting and bidding. Um, so there is a lot of that that you have to um, overcome, explaining, um, you know, have them ask the question and listen to the answers. I am not bidding, betting. And this is a fundamental analysis that we do when we decide on what to invest in and for a long term. This is, it comes from here and goes from there. 50% of the people are not understanding because they hear the news saying, oh, stock market is down again. It's like, you know, something bad happened. It's like magical. And then I do explain to my clients on the first day they come you're going to give me this money and within three months it could go go down 10 percent your hundred thousand dollars will look like ninety thousand dollars how does that feel horrible (laughs) why would i do that it will come back up so there is a lot of education but my uh, goal and why i'm so committed to this is because i know i am helping lots of people I receive handwritten notes saying that without you, I couldn't have done a solid budget. I couldn't have saved because of doubts of the stock market. I would have wasted my time with um, political conditions of that time. But remember, you have one life to live, one, one time invest and then retire. You can't redo this again. So working with a professional, so I explain that. It is extremely important for me to know that they're gonna doubt this, to gain their trust, and also use non-technical language. So um, I've learned a lot of things when I was getting my MBA degree and also studying for um, Securities Exchange Commission exam too. So um, I feel very lucky. Of course, I, I skipped the, the baby. Baby came, this, n- number two came nine years now later. We're back. So let's go back to when your beautiful babies came into the picture. Right. Our second uh, child, our daughter, came um, in 2003 when we were 38. And I was just, um, you know, even at that time in Turkey, even my grandmother, I think, said, um, <laughs> So uh, it was not. The people were ex- thinking it was too late for you to be. Too late for me to be having a second baby at the age of 38. Right now it's the norm, it's the average, Mm -hmm. uh, even for the first baby. So, and um, I knew that it was not late. I just was, uh, we were not ready and now we were. And that was a great experience, stayed home for one year. But our nine year old then uh, helped out a lot Mm -hmm. and um, all worked out. So with her coming too, our lives um, turn into, okay, how are, we gonna, how are we gonna make sure that these kids have their goals, what they wanna achieve? It's not about us anymore. 
my, my job, my career, my world. It is about their world. And um, just, just like any other Turkish family who made it here, who feel comfortable around here, um, at uh, many times during this year, because the kids have nine years between them, restarting uh, of you know uh, raising a child from a from a from diapers to um young girl that she is now she's uh, going to get into college next year um i felt like um restarting and because i retried and got back on and changed things changed around it is a lot easier for me to talk to them about our son t tells me that you change uh, countries and cities um, and then you made your own decisions. Nobody was, um, you know, making decisions for us. So they are, he feels stronger, uh, because, um, you know, if he kind of calls it, you, you pulled yourself from your uh, bootstraps to, to get here in so many ways. Yes. But, um, supportive, uh, family and good conditions and good <laughs> mental health, a lot of stamina. I don't lose stamina much. And I change the agenda a lot. Um, whenever I feel like there is a, um, some people just say that it seems like you're having more fun than others. I um, may what see- What is your secret? Yeah, I, am, I mean, it is, it might, it's not a secret. I want everybody to know that I change the agenda of um, what the conversation is. If it is negative, not productive, I do delete it and restart. There's a lot of reset button. And uh, when we're conversations, I kind of take it to where it is inspirational. What could we be doing instead of worrying about that? And certain political figures, should we be talking about him any longer? Yes, it is upsetting. But what is that taking from us? What could we be doing? So changing the agenda of today it helps me by the way just to clarify we don't want to go into politics in these interviews um, but what I hear you say is part of uh, continuing to be a vibrant and full of life and positive individual who seems to have extra stamina has to do with your perspective yes absolutely true um, if it is upsetting to me I will uh, not acknowledge it any longer. It's a plan. It's a program uh, in my mind to say, this is not that important anymore. Next thing is cooking. I love cooking. So oh, you're a good cook too. Well, uh, it's a test kitchen. Let's see what comes out of it. There were times we throw away uh, immediately. Uh, I burned a lot of food. So um, for did you me, learn uh, from your mom? I yes. guess a, uh, when talking with Turkish women, food has to come up because we have, in my very biased opinion, the best cuisine in the world. So tell us a little bit about, uh, was your mom a good cook? Did you learn things from her? And I guess you did burn a couple of things along the way. How did your chefness evolve over the years? Chefness, um, hardly, hardly. It's a test kitchen at the age of 55 still. Uh, I would say my mom, when I, mean, I left uh, uh, Marston for college at the age of 17, as you know, high school was three years, but I left at the age of 17. I watched my mom, who's an excellent cook, uh, how practical she was, and she did not have a car to get in and go to the grocery store to get something else. Whatever she had, mm -hmm. she would figure something out. And in Turkey, people will call you and say, I'm on my way. Mm. make it happen right so <laughs> she would do that and I saw her many 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 times how easy she made it seem that this was doable healthy focus on what and also presentation mm. um, mom, mom was big on that so I watched her many many years of doing that so when I left at the age of 17 I wasn't really a um, cook at all even in, in college, I mean, ramen noodles, right? It, it wasn't a fun uh, from 17 to 21. It wasn't fun years either. And But later on, I would always go back to my mom's um, cooking 
but she was a you know um, stay home mom. That's all she did. She was very very focused on that presentation. That still the smell of that kitchen, how easy the warm something comes out, and everybody is loving you, is something that I said that is the key. <laughs> but I gotta get make this food thing happening. Uh, I think take getting attention, being liked, loved all that nurturing um, nature of women, period. Also, my mother-in-law, um, early on, I always watched her, even though in different countries, I, when I was visiting her, she was an amazing chef, actually. Um, her German background, her German mom was a very good cook. Just happens to be um, lots of different people I met were really good cooks. So I watched them how they would put together so i wouldn't be just doing the Marston dishes i would try out something totally different too again going back to i want to make it happen people will be happy we are going to be uh together because of it so and for somebody who knows you i would say you're a, a person who brings people together through that but when you entertain it's always really beautifully presented it's not only that what you feed us is delicious uh, but your presentation stands out always colorful matching tasteful Thank and you. it goes beyond the offering to really uh, i'm deeply grateful to you myself to how many connections you have created for me here in ann arbor as more of a newcomer through you, I've made many, many friends. So I think there's that added dimension you bring as you, you know, make invitations um, that you not only feed people, but you connect them. You're a, a creating connections kind of person. I love that and thank you so much. Um, but uh, it is because I want to be connected and I assume everybody want to me want to be con connected to some people whom they can click and there's lots of opportunities but sometimes we kind of see two people and keep going because we're not invited to other environments why because there's not opportunity that came up and i feel just like the food itself that brings uh like and uh you know want to be included so food and connection is something that I, I yearn for. When I first came though, there was a couple of years of not knowing who's who, where, where are people? Mm -hmm. So I, there, there were um, time periods where I felt lonely. Mm -hmm. um, and I just assumed that everybody feels lonely, then I should just invite them. If they are not, they will say no. <laughs> and, but they will still appreciate being included um, and in this country, and because of your profession, you do deal with um, a lot of um, depression that is not sickness. Anybody could just um, get um, drawn into it. People are lonely. I don't know if you agree. I do agree. I think there's more loneliness here because the way uh, we interact socially is different. You mentioned a moment ago how in Turkey, People just to this day, I think, have a habit of stopping by. So you don't have to uh, work on it as much, I think. Yes. Even again, when I go back to Turkey today, I haven't lived there for 20 years, but the next day I'll be invited uh, to meet with, you know, I'll have five people to choose from. You almost don't have an opportunity to be alone in Turkey. And yes. here it is, it is hard to find the people with whom you belong and to be invited to, yeah, friendship gatherings. Friendship is harder here in general. And I hear it from pretty much every client that I see in my office. Loneliness is a is a harder thing and a more frequent thing that we have to deal with here. Yes, absolutely. And, and not see it as a um, sign of weakness. If you say you're lonely, if you are seeking to reach out to people, but it feels like, well, how come you, know, you don't have a ton of friends already not hanging out already? So I think we should all, um, for newcomers and people who've been here a long time, 
what do you want? That's exactly what they want. You know what you want. So repeat, copy and paste it, do it again, and you will reach out to so many people. Most of the time, it, things will, be, will work out. The fact that you reached out, it will work out. There was, there's going to be a number of very small number of times that you're going to say, oh, well, that didn't work out. It's worth it you know um, include people because you want to be included mm -hmm. um, so that is very easy life is difficult but if you keep it simple um, I think for me finding happiness and moving yourself out of um, uh, small depressions because of the weather this and that um, you could uh, try to keep things simple and not question it too too long repeat it what worked before, say, do it again, it will happen. And don't despair that, well, I've been doing this too long and it didn't work. Most of the time it did work. We have short-term memory when we feel um, a little depressed. And uh, right now, and I shouldn't be preaching to the choir, you understand um, you know, th those kind of conversations that when you have. It is the season of no sun time you're going in. So what would you recommend to us, really? I want to learn. Um, I'll, I'll continue. I'll add a little to what you just said. It's called the negativity bias. And Tara Brock, one of the wisdom teachers of our times, talks about this. She says that negative experiences are like Velcro. They stick. And positive experiences are like Teflon. They sort of slide off the surface of our beingness. So we do end up focusing more on what's negative and what hurt us and to then actively, like you're doing, bring our attention to the positive and to make the effort to have more of what we desire is really a helpful way to go. So yeah, I that would recommend that everybody do a little bit more like you're doing and that they uh, lead uh, in creating the experiences they desire for themselves because that is again as you say very often others are actually sharing the struggles that we are experiencing and when you reach out people respond and everybody benefits everybody benefits absolutely also one of the things that Sibel I like doing uh, as much as I can not daily um, taking notes, um, have a schedule on hand, knowing where my, my time is spent mm. is helping me quite a bit in those times of when you're on vacation, when you are doing good things, it's already everything flows so well. You end up with a beautiful dinner and fall asleep really easily. But we are not on vacation even um, more than 10 days in a year. Uh, we try, but a long weekend and all this. So. What I found useful is that the positive experiences that I want, can I get sucked into a, a very negative um, advertisement and the bias uh, views and social media that it became an epidemic of people spending too much time and energy of watching but not doing. They're, and we are all vulnerable, I really think that as smart as we think we are and organized we think we are, we could get sucked into and because of the negative bias, right? Social Dilemma is a recent Netflix movie that came out that I highly recommend, especially I think important for our children to be aware of because yes, as you say, it is addictive and it's, we have to exercise great discipline to make sure the quality of our lives does not suffer because of the, of the addictive quality of social media. Yes. And so social how, do you, how do you exercise discipline? How do you manage not to be pulled into the addictive element of it? Absolutely. Just writing down seven o'clock. I'm on a Sunday. I'm up seven o'clock. Our dog is up at 630 normally. We have to talk about your dog even for two minutes maybe, but later. Okay. Yes. So, and that's another happiness bringer that was planned, by the way. Um, yes, you know, our age is 55. 
and you you watch people who own um, pets any pets um, are happier why because they stop thinking about themselves or oh, do I have wrinkles and this and that when you are taking the dog out to you know good go for a good walk good run their food their hygiene all of this that is our uh, focus so that is um, a little uh, segue but overall the discipline of writing down what have you done today what are your expectations from today well there's a lot of um, the laundry needs to be done a uh, little shopping all of this um, in between what are some happy moments that we are going to uh, you know have our, for ourselves create out of nowhere because things are happening around us and then it could suck us right in a bad phone, phone conversation with a family member that is that's not what you wanted to have but it did suck your your day out well i got a plan i have to read it this is what i need to do next hour because at three o'clock something like that you have something to look forward to that you need to put the little makeup on hair needs to be good find some colorful in it but today i kind of overdid it so colorful um makes me happy um looking fine makes me happy so i know that i should be doing them first thing in the morning don't drag the day and it's two o'clock in the afternoon because you just read something as we, as we said however smart we think we are we need to be disciplined about um creation creating happiness what makes you happy you know it write it down spell it out it's in writing so also i don't know if you agree the, our memories are, if you watch something, 30% uh, probably we are really uh, getting. But if I'm writing it down, even the, the act of writing reminds me that that is something that I wrote that is real. It's on a paper. I can see it. So that's what I do. I do write down, you know, and at the end of the day, it's check mark, check mark, accomplish. It's, this is the Sunday routine. As you know, your schedule on a Monday through Friday, clients, 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 how am I going to help them? Know what they need, understand, listen, ask, get information, go back to them. So we have a lot of regimented routines in our um, five days. Um, over the weekend, I kind of feel like not regimented, but still I won't regiment it. I don't like it when I can sleep in until noon and I'm not capable of sleeping any hours that is um, longer than eight hours in a day. So, so what I hear you say actually is not that uh, regimented in the sense that it's a, some kind of a forced schedule you're carrying out, but making sure you are living the way you want to, doing things that lift you up as opposed to sucking down your energy or ending up making you feel bad. Absolutely, because if you don't have a plan, somebody else has, that is namely CNN, who's trying to sell. Uh, so let's not get into politics of any sort, so right. um, I'll bracket that. <laughs> but TV is another definitely thing that we need to curb because it can so easily take up a lot of our time and I love what you said a few minutes ago about it's better that we are living as opposed to perpetually finding ourselves in the observational seat, right? Watching either a movie or in social media, looking at what others' lives look like instead of that being able to live our own lives. That's right. Because we want to be like some other people. And when we find things in common, even negativity or positivity, negativity pulls us right in. Watching other people's or saying what they're saying, um, spending time, our minds are at some point is just stopping uh, thinking for ourselves. We start repeating or sharing other people's thoughts too much. That is kind of, you give up. So tell yeah. me, because we have limited time, I want to hear you are somebody who constantly creates new experiences for herself. So tell us a couple of the newer activities you are doing that are all about experience. I have a few things in mind, but I'll let you uh, 
the flying comes into mind and you have, do a couple of things on top of the water. So what are some, some activities you create for yourself that put you in the role of the experiencer? Well, uh, very light sports, I should say, uh, but I would, you know, paddle boarding on water is something that is, uh, I discovered through a client three years ago, I kind of felt like, why didn't I do this for so many years? Um, because I wouldn't normally get a paddleboard and stand up on it and go on a lake. Why would I? And it would look odd, right? And uh, I don't even know, I didn't even know the concept existed, something like that. Mm -hmm. Or out of nowhere, you know, uh, I would just call a friend and uh, let's ride the rubber ducky. I called her up. I remember she's like 10 years uh, older than me. But she says that I kind of give her like, out of nowhere, actually, you called me on a rubber ducky ride. We went into the, uh, we went to the lake. And just to give an example, these are little examples of I wouldn't do normally. I think it would be fun. Um, a lot of people are just say, well, I'm just going to hurt myself getting in a rubber ducky and getting on a, um, you know, water. When you are doing it, you just realize that it's a whole big surface. You can't really, nothing can, most things cannot go wrong. And um, I consider myself a swimmer anyways, and so, so is she. Or I would just call and just say, I've got 45 minutes. Let's hit a couple of tennis balls. When you say that, you have a very little time. You cannot sit around and should we be doing this next Tuesday? No, this is this afternoon. And I just happen to know she is single, lives alone, has a beautiful dog. All right, I'm going to get lucky. Hey, Shelly, let's do this. All right, great. Let me find my shoes. Let me Why? It is something to look forward to. It's going to happen very soon. I know she's going to feel better if she gets out of the house and hits a couple of balls. Did we do a tennis match of the century? No. And I do keep scores, by the way. And then she... <laughs> Oh, yeah. we keep scores she would just say oh i just don't want to hit you know no 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 we are going to keep scores so everybody um so what i'm trying to say is that when you have rules your brain is totally totally paying attention when you don't meaning example okay between two and three o'clock you're going to go for a walk and this will take an hour don't finish it in 20 minutes this is supposed to take an hour therefore more oxygen so uh, scheduled happiness healthy things that we need to do and most recently by the way there's noom it's called n-o-o-m mm -hmm. eating uh, healthy while doing a little bit of um you know sugars and and this and that but making you walk you need to now that you had that chocolate bar is the tiny chocolate um bar piece you, that's a 20 minute walk can you do that anybody can do that right Mm -hmm. But it is a, so it's an it, app that you're using to help monitor and keep you keep things real, I guess. So what I hear you say is you want to be aware. It really comes uh, down to mindfulness, which, as you know, I'm a big fan of. So not lying to yourself, but being fully aware of what you are doing, where your attention is going and for how long. Absolutely. I know that it works for me. And there are times, and I'm not saying this is so easy. It is negativity just pulls us in. So therefore, it is, you're, you're, it's an effort. It's an effort. When I walk 20 minutes, brisk walk makes me happy. I've done this 100 times. Repeat it, right? But no, you could just get in a, um, some negative talk. That could take 20 minutes too. <laughs> Absolutely. So I always say that. It's sort of interesting to me that we're talking in a way that I wonder if people will end up thinking, oh, your life is all regimented. Whereas the reality is you're somebody, when I think of your friendship, is you're always going to be the one person who will be up for whatever I offer her to do, as long as it's slightly interesting. Absolutely. You call, I'm game. Um, I'm not pretending, you know, you're just hanging out. The kids are on their own. Um, absolutely. Easy, easy. 
And if you make yourself uh, to, to the listeners, to uh, the audience, if you make yourself available for an experience, you're going to find out about you that you're going to say, I should have done this long time ago. Just, I think you are um, implying that many people feel not ready, not available. It is easy to say not now because that experience you don't know right. uh, and it may go bad and it may give you a bad experience. A lot of people are just worried about if this thing does, does not going to, does not work out right? more so than what if it does. <laughs> yeah. So what we had said earlier, the importance of flexibility, I suppose we can add to that the importance of open-mindedness. Yes. That definitely makes for a life better lived when we're open minded and flexible and up for new experiences. Yeah. And one more thing about being a foreigner in a different country um, realizing that you are living with another culture and be the good study of their culture, history. Uh, that locally what's going on around you it's a it's something that adds to you does not take away from you you don't lose your culture you don't lose your um, identity by understanding where they're coming from i i am seeing lots and lots of um i i meet i used to be a you know public relations person for turkish american cultural association i worked many years alongside with so many volunteers that's why I met a lot more people. And I've seen language could, could be an issue, culture could be an issue, not open to it. Uh, we live in America. We live as a foreigner in another country. Represent your country. It's absolutely necessary. But be a good study. Um, and I have some tr uh, tricks that I was telling you about. I got my address book and whose names and their kids' names are written there. Mm -hmm. I care about people's, you know, because if somebody says, I am John and Bailey's, I am touched mm -hmm. that they remembered my kid's name, right? Mm -hmm. So I do it for them too. Um, so I'm cheating, right? I have to write it down because I do meet so many people. I mean, um, typical uh, week, I do talk to 55 people and I record it. Yeah, so no way to remember anymore. <laughs> Who's <laughs> Karen? So many names, uh, Tyler. <laughs> so I have to write it down. So we're almost at time, my dear. Um, is there anything, any last, other last that you want to add before we end for today? Any question I didn't uh, think of asking you that you'd want to answer? Well, I'd like to finish with understanding as a, as a uh, professional yourself, if you could give me, I want to understand, when you first came here, did you feel like you can have your business, have your cake and eat it too? Did you? When you first come here, originally? You, America, you mean? America, yep. Uh, I did, I guess. It ended up being quite a bit more difficult than I thought it would. So I had a little bit of, you know how they say, ignorance is bliss. If I knew how hard it <laughs> would have been, I might have thought twice. But uh, I, I'm one of those people that also shares your opinion that if the, you want something, if there's a will, there is a way. I do believe in that. And sometimes it's not easy, but... If you really want it, there are ways to figure out how to get to your want. And worst case, you change your want. You come up with a new one. <laughs> That's right. I had a teacher once uh, recommended that I should have a lot of wants. That way, at least some of them will come true. And I thought that was really a wise teaching. So I <laughs> Absolutely. Start here and then work your way down. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This was a lovely hour, Asla. Uh, really appreciate you participating in this project. Thank you, Thank my you dear. Much, dear. I enjoyed it so much too. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>